neuroscience, religion, philosophy, drug addiction, race, and more. All in one book. It might sound like there's a lot going on, but it actually works. If any or all of those topics appeal to you, then stick around. Hi, thanks for tuning in to Noir Histoire. I'm Natasha, and in this episode, I'll be discussing Transcendent Kingdom by Yagi Yassi. Transcendent Kingdom is Yagi Yassi's sophomore novel, which follows Gifty, a neuroscience PhD candidate, as she researches reward-seeking behavior in mice. Gifty's task is a difficult challenge, which she hopes will offer insights into better understanding and treating depression and addiction in humans. Her work is inspired in part by her brother's death from a heroin overdose and her mother's debilitating grief. But deep down inside, Gifty was drawn to her work as the Alabama born and raised child of Ghanaian parents who struggles to balance the Christianity of her childhood with the hard science in which she seeks comfort as an adult. Gifty's family began as a foursome, consistent of her parents, Ma and the Chin Chin Man, and older brother Nana. But over time, the family has been reduced to just her and her mom. Beginning during childhood, she keeps a journal where she writes to God and also about the things that are happening in her life. It's interesting to have her go back and read her thoughts and experiences from childhood through the eyes of an adult. It's also cute that she uses these random code names for her family members when it's obvious who she's referring to. Her parents were both in their 30s when they got married, which was considered rather old in Ghana. They initially have a hard time trying to conceive a child, and when all else fails, Ma turns to her faith and dedicates herself to praying. Her efforts are successful, and she and the Chin Chin Man become pregnant. During this period, she had somewhat of a crisis of faith, but the experience reaffirmed her reliance on prayer and her religion to get through difficulties and find solutions to her problems. The Chin Chin Man is described as a bright-spirited, jovial man, while Ma seems a bit more reserved and strict. But like any parents, they both want to give their children a good start in life. Given their difficulties trying to conceive, they come to regard Nana as their miracle baby. The Chin Chin Man loves and is content with Ghana, but Ma feels that Ghana will not offer Nana all the things the wider world has to offer. She sees America as a place of great opportunities and wants to move there to give Nana a better life. This leads to arguments with the Chin Chin Man, but he eventually relents and they immigrate to Huntsville, Alabama. This is an early indicator that they don't place importance on the same things and they have different aspirations for them. Ma is blunt to the point of coming across as being callous. She blurts things out with no kind of filter or any attempt to shield Nana or Gifty or be considerate of their feelings. Yet, when it comes to the difficult but important conversations, she's unable or unwilling to have them. Gifty points out that her mom isn't the kind of parent to sugarcoat things to make the kids feel comfortable. But it wasn't just that. Ma seems to go out of her way to say unnecessarily mean things to Gifty. It reminded me of people who proudly say that they're brutally honest. Being honest is a positive trait, but being brutal about it is often unnecessary. Usually, the inclination to be brutal comes from a lack of consideration for the feelings of others, rather than a sense of duty to be straightforward. There was a bit of a culture shock for both Ma and the Chin Chin Man when they arrived in America but it differed in some respects due to their genders. Ma finds work as a home health aide, taking care of people in their late years. The first man she works for is incredibly racist and calls her a racial slur instead of her name. Yet she doesn't see this as the man being prejudiced, but instead brushes it aside as the man just being old. Ma works very hard, but because the job doesn't pay much, she has difficulties providing for the family. And she's like always at work. The Chin Chin Man is described as being six feet, four inches, with an athletic build that many people find intimidating. He's stereotyped and on multiple occasions accused of shoplifting. When he also tries to work as a home health aide, clients are uncomfortable with having a large black man in their homes. He's initially unable to find a place outside of his home where he feels safe from suspicion and judgment, which temporarily causes him to become a recluse. It's worth noting that when Ma and the Chin Chin Man experience difficulties in life, they both turn inward and have limited interactions with their family. Gifty develops into a child and adult with tremendous amounts of angst and insecurities. She's dealing with incredibly traumatic events in her life, but doesn't receive the support and guidance that she needs to learn how to cope with these things healthily. But to some extent, her journal, the decision to channel her emotions into her studies, and the example of her older brother helps to keep her on the right track, though it doesn't seem to help much with her emotional suffering. So like she gets through it, but she still suffers anyway. 
Nana is in the same situation, but with the added pressure of being a miracle child and having spent more time with both parents in the home, he was very close to his father and lost him around the start of puberty, an important and confusing period in many children's lives. This is especially true for a black boy growing into a large black man in the American South. Nana shows early promise as a soccer player, a sport through which he bonds with the Chin Chin Man. The loss of the Chin Chin Man upsets Gifty, but she's able to reasonably cope while Nana is left devastated. He bottles up his feelings by choosing to not speak about them and instead has random mini explosions of anger. There's an important moment in Transcendent Kingdom where Nana finds himself emotionally unable to continue playing soccer, which was his father's sport. As Nana gets older, grows taller, and begins to define his own identity, he begins playing basketball. I saw this as Nana dealing with his hurt and anger towards his father by quitting the sport they shared and becoming involved with the sport of his choosing. I was surprised that Ma comforted Nana in this moment of despair, as she loved her children but wasn't described as being particularly affectionate. Because of the Chin Chin Man's working situation, he spent time at home with Nana, through which the two developed a close relationship that Ma actually envied. She worked a lot and quite hard to provide the, for the family, so it's understandable that she's not home as much as the Chin Chin Man. But when she does have the opportunity to be home with the kids, she's actually a bit harsh. Gifted recalls that she doesn't keep the little arts and crafts projects or knickknacks that they make in school, yet she seemingly wore towards her patients and their families. Something that I found particularly troubling was that Ma and the Chin Chin Man doted on Nana because of the difficulties they had conceiving a child. On the other hand, Gifty was unplanned, and her parents, instead of being overjoyed at having another child, seemed unimpressed and probably a bit displeased, or at least Ma did it. I've heard that sometimes parents can have a favorite child, but the good ones usually try not to show favoritism. But Gifty's parents, or at least her mom, make it a point to let her know that they were content with their first child and weren't thrilled about having to raise a second. I remember watching a television show a long time ago, this was like a long, long time ago, where parents dedicated more of their time and attention to one of their children. It was like one of those nanny shows or something. The child had some health issues as a baby, but was now a healthy and robust school-aged child. But the parents continued to neglect the other kids out of concern for this one child. I saw that to a degree with Nana, where he was highly valued because there was such difficulty in conceiving him, and Gifty became an afterthought because her conception was effortless. There were a few situations where Gifty reminisces about clamoring for attention as a child, but her parents being distracted with their thoughts or Nana. Gifty doesn't receive the attention she likely needed from her parents to develop into a confident young woman. Over time, her extroverted nature fizzles out, and she turns inward to comfort herself when problems arise in the family, much like her parents do. Gifty points out that we tend to preserve fond memories of people who are no longer around, either due to death or distance. We more easily remember the flaws and shortcomings of those who are still alive or nearby. I think this applies to some degree for both Gifty and Ma. Gifty has fond memories of kindness from her brother, who has since passed away. But when she looks back over her life with him, it becomes clear that while there are some positive memories, he was also a very angry young man who at times lashed out at both her and Ma. Ma, on the other hand, mourns the loss of her firstborn child and laments that she's been left with only Gifty. I took a pause when Gifty recalled her mother's comment, but it's unclear if she was pointing out the irony or meant it in the sense that Gifty was an unwanted consolation prize. Nana and Gifty are of Ghanaian heritage, but don't know much about Ghana, as Nana was a baby when he left, and Gifty was born and raised in America. They experience both the good and bad that America has to offer, but with nothing else to compare it to, America's home and all they know. Their mother and father, on the other hand, were born and raised in Ghana, and immigrated to America as adults, but even they have different perspectives on the hardships they face in America. Ma looks at her life in America and sees all the future possibilities that might be available to her children. She sees the life that she is working hard to provide as being a step up from what they would have had in Ghana. But the Chin Chin Man views America through the lens of what he gave up in Ghana and the little he got in return with regards to finances and also social interactions. The Chin Chin Man is described as being 
warm and tender towards the children, and an outgoing, friendly man with everyone else. Ma seems to be the opposite, as she's more reserved and non-emotive. People aren't as friendly and neighborly as they might have been in Ghana, and we never get a true understanding of Ma's feelings, but from Gifty's perspective, she adapts seemingly well to life in Alabama and doesn't seem affected by the hardships and differences they face. The Chin Chin Man has a hard time adapting, as it seems he's unwelcome in this new society. Ma is downright cold and even callous at points, but we never learn much about her life before marriage to the Chin Chin Man. There's no real opportunity to understand how she came to be the person she is or her inner feelings about the hardships the family endures. It's not that past life experiences would excuse her behavior, but rather that there might be some explanation of how she came to be the person she is. There's a quote that I thought was very truthful and insightful, which changed my perspective on Ma a bit. And I'm quoting here. If I've thought of my mother as callous, and many times I have, then it's important to remind myself what a callus is, the hardened tissue that forms over a wound, end quote. And I think we see this in Gifty telling her own story. As a child and into young adulthood, she didn't have a clear vision of who she wanted to be, but rather what her religion and the world around her told her she should be. She recognizes from an early age that there are things within her mother that she does not like, and her mother is not the person she would like to become. But as Transcendent Kingdom progresses, Gifty comes to realize that try as she might, there are bits and pieces of her mother within her. I think this shows how you're shaped by both nature and nurture. The people around us, both our family members and community, have an impact on our thoughts, perspectives, and identities. Gifty reaches a point following the death of her brother where her hometown begins to feel too small, and she feels as though she has to escape. To grow as a person and to find some degree of happiness in life, she has to leave behind the people and places that no longer and likely never brought her happiness or a sense of contentment. And with that, she goes off to college, first to Harvard for her undergraduate degree, and later Stanford. In reading about the difficulties that the family experienced following the move to America, I couldn't help but wonder why Ma didn't just move the family back to Ghana. But in later reading about Gifty's need to get out of Alabama, I began to think that maybe Ma had also felt a similar driving force in Ghana. Maybe despite the hardships and the sacrifice, it was better than living with the limitations she felt in Ghana. I think that some of Ma's depression stems from her guilt about the decision for her and the kids to remain in Alabama. But there are hardships all around the world, and who's to say that they wouldn't have found some new ones had they returned to Ghana? From a very young age, Nana shows promise as an athlete and became a prize player on any team of which he was a member. Nana is still young at the point where he decides he no longer wants to play soccer, but the team has come to depend on him as their star player. A sense of obligation pushes him to try to continue playing, although his heart is no longer in the sport. Gifter remembers looking into his face during that brief moment and catching a glimpse into the vulnerability and hurt that Nana hides behind a facade of premature manhood. I thought it was crazy how much importance parents, coaches, and other adults place on these kids playing sports. As a young child, Nana has to deal with parents from other teams yelling racial slurs at him simply because he's a good player. When he gets older and begins playing basketball, he becomes a local superstar. But it seems like few if any of these adults took any real interest in him as a person beyond his abilities as an athlete. And when he begins to struggle with addiction as a teen, they lament the loss of what could have been. Not what he could have been as a person or the additional hardships he will now face in his life, but rather the loss of his abilities for the team in the town. In some ways, Nana's story reminded me of the unfortunate tale of many athletes, the young men who dedicate their entire childhood and teenage years to sports, but unable to make it to the majors, they find themselves lost because no one took the time to develop the other areas of their lives. Everyone has only been interested in their physical health and abilities, but didn't take the time to ensure they developed academically and emotionally to become healthy, well-rounded adults. And like Nana, when they are no longer able to help the team win games, the once cheering crowd now greets them with taunts and ridicule at best, or indifference at worst. 
Growing up in Huntsville, Gifty goes to church and school with people who do not look like her and are not always welcoming. There's an ugly undercurrent that identifies her and her family as outsiders who will never truly be a part of the wider community. As Nana and Gifty try to understand and come to terms with their personal religious beliefs and identities, they ask questions. And because some of the religious leaders haven't taken the time to consider what their beliefs would mean or signify to people who are not exactly like them, they give flippant responses that have deep implications for these kids. There's an expectation of blind faith without asking questions or seeking knowledge that many of the local people are comfortable with. That closed-mindedness and lack of comfort play a part in what turns Gifty away from the church. She moves further away from her childhood beliefs during her studies, but she also finds new ways to believe through questioning, which I think ultimately helps her find a way back to religion. Gifty enters young adulthood as a virgin, who has no knowledge of her anatomy and is uncomfortable with her sexuality as a result of her religious upbringing. In general, Gifty doesn't have a clear idea of who she is and is uncomfortable with her entire being. During college, she began to experiment with her sexuality and branched out to form a few friendships. She spent and would continue to spend a lot of her time alone while hoping for, if not intimacy, then at least some kind of a connection with others. But after her first relationships fizzled, she began entering into these shallow one-night stands. They allow her to experience the quasi-intimacy or maybe just the presence of someone else that she seeks while being able to remain emotionally unavailable and distant. We learned that this goes back to her childhood, where she felt a need to hide the difficulties and emotional turmoil she was experiencing. This tendency to close herself off after sharing intimate details about herself or her life with others prevents her from forming the relationship she seems to desperately want. Throughout Transcendent Kingdom, Gifty approaches things from a dramatic either-or perspective, where she goes from one end of the spectrum to the other without stopping anywhere in between. By her late 20s, she's unhappy and searching for an understanding of why and how to change this. Her very black and white way of seeing things draws her to bouncing between opposites when quite often the answer to her problems, or at least a shot at being content, most likely lies somewhere in the middle. To deal with her discomfort, Gifty switches tactics from just isolating herself to forming relationships and then passive aggressively pushing the other person away when they start to get too close. She hasn't fully dealt with the issues that have arisen in part from her religious upbringing, and some of her issues are a result of her personality and also her experiences. How she sees the world as a person who is unsure of herself, who she wants to be, and what's important to her versus what outside forces tell her she should be or should believe. At one point in Transcendent Kingdom, Gifty reminisces about a time when she attended church and learned about the idea of dedicating her life to Christ by praying constantly. She took this quite literally and set out to pray nonstop, but she was disappointed with herself as she found that despite being willing to pray, she was unable to stop her mind from being easily distracted. In speaking to her mother about this dilemma, Maya explained that by simply living a good and upstanding life, Gifty would be living a constant prayer. I thought it was a fairly positive and realistic philosophy that applies to Gifty, although she might not have seen it for herself. Gifty spends much of Transcendent Kingdom lamenting both her naivete about religion and also her loss of faith. But keeping her mother's message in mind, it puts Gifty's life in a different perspective. This child has been through so much, while being given so little, has grown into an adult who is compassionate in her own way. She's trying through her own means to help other people find release from the sorrows of addiction. Gifty is flawed, but in living a life of service, she is following the teachings of Christ. I'm not a religious person, but I am open to hearing about other people's perspective on religion, philosophy, and the world in general. I wasn't put off by the concept of transcending kingdom, but it did take me a while to get into the story. Gifty's early religious beliefs and the details of her later neurological experiments didn't immediately draw me in. About two-thirds of the way through Transcendent Kingdom, she began to discuss her philosophy of science versus religion, and I found that very interesting. I was a bit lost during the first two-thirds of Transcendent Kingdom as to why she felt the need to choose between science or religion when the two could coexist. But I was drawn in when she came to this realization as well, and began to sort through her conflicted feelings about science and religion. 
Instead of continuing to choose one side or the other, I thought she came to a point where she was more comfortable defining her beliefs and developing a philosophy for herself based on the things she connected with within religion and science. At the start of Transcendent Kingdom, as I learned about Ma, the Chinchin Man, and Nana, I didn't particularly care for any of them and thought they were all mean and selfish in their ways. But as the book progressed and I learned more about their experiences and thought about the things Gifty might not have been privy to, my feelings towards them softened a bit. They've all done some wrong to Gifty, and I wanted her to find some sense of comfort, contentment, and a bit of happiness in life. But I also recognized that Gifty's family members, like most people, were also carrying around internal hurts, pains, and disappointments. By the time Transcendent Kingdom ended, I didn't necessarily like all of the characters, but I had come to care about them. I don't think Transcendent Kingdom is for everybody. As for a good portion, I thought it wasn't for me. The first thing I would state is to not approach Transcendent Kingdom expecting it to be anything like Yagiyasi's previous book, Homecoming. That book flows like your typical story, whereas Transcendent Kingdom can feel a bit rambling and freeform at times. It struck me as someone sharing their philosophy and science and religion with moments from their life and work as a research scientist thrown in. I think you have a better chance of connecting with Transcending Kingdom if you have an interest in any of those topics, especially areas in which they overlap. Show notes are available on the Noir Histoire website by the link in the episode description. Right now, I'm planning to release two book reviews per month, so if you enjoyed this episode and want more book recommendations, subscribe to the channel, Click the notification bell and check out my book review playlist.